Question 23 talks about signs of lesion of the olfactory pathway. So we know the olfactory pathway, right? Um, you can see the olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb, the olfactory cortex, and the centers. Okay. So if there's lesion of the osmo receptor in the mucus, so here you can see that we have what the um, osmo receptors, or let's just say the olfactory nerves, as you can see, right? So if you have lesion there, we're going to see loss or a decreased smell bilaterally. Yes, then lesion of your olfactory bulb, it will be ipsilateral one side um, loss of smell. Yes, so loss of smell is an up smear and decrease of smell is hypo hyposmia. Yes, as you can see the spelling here. So if there's lesion of the uh, subcortical center, which include the olfactory tegmentum, septum pallacidum, there'll be ipsilateral uh, one side um, hyposmia or anopsmia. Yes, so there'll be loss of smell sensation on one side. If there's lesion of the cortical center of the, of the if there's lesion of the cortical center, you're going to see no change in the olfaction. So if there's just, if there's lesion in one side of the uh, cortical center, you're not going to see any change in of in olfaction, which is smell, because we have both centers, we have both centers that process this smell. And there's irritation of the cortical centers will be olfactory hallucinations. So question 24 talks about signs and symptoms of optic nerve lesion. Yes. So depending on which part of the optic nerve pathway is damaged, we're going to have different presentation. Yes. If there is lesion of the optic nerve, there will be blurring, also known as AMA neurosis, A-M-A-U-R-O-S-I-S. This word is very important to say to your teacher. Then if there is lesion in the optic chiasm, it will, the blindness will be bilateral. Yes, an absent reaction to light reflex. Depending on where the pathway is, yes, depending. Depending on where the lesion is in the pathway, if in the internal part of the optic chiasm, it will be by temporal heteronymous hemianopsia. If it's the external part, it will be by nasal heteronymous hemianopia. So if it's the visual tract, or let's say if it's the optic tract, yes, if it's the optic tract, not optic nerve, optic tract, it will be, if it's on the left side of the optic tract, it will be right side homonymous hemianopsia. Yes? What other thing can your teacher talk about? If there is lesion in the lateral gen geniculate body or lesion in the anterior tubercle of the corpora or the gemina, there will be loss of um, pupil reaction to light. Yes? However, convergence and divergence will be preserved. If there's lesion in the um, in the internal capsule, so on the left side, in the internal capsule, it will be right-sided hemi and hemi anesthesia, hemiplegia, and hemi anopsia, as you can see. Yes, if there is irritation of the occipital lobe, there will be visual hallucination. If there is lesion of the occipital lobe, there will be visual agnosis. So this visual agnosia is the person can see, but the person cannot just the person does not know what the person is seeing, basically, because the hospital lobe helps to process this information to for you to know that this is a cat, yes. But if your hospital lobe is damaged, you the person is seeing it, but the person doesn't know what it is. So question twenty seven talks about the cortex and the pons centers of voluntary conjugate movement of the head and eyes. So I know that cranial nerves three, four, and six serves to innovate the head and eyes muscle, right? So we're going to talk about the signs and the lesions. So if there's lesion of the cerebral peduncles on the left side, you're going to see um, oculomotor nerve palsy. Oculomotor nerve palsy include double vision, which is known as dip diplopia, includes uh, drooping of the eyelids, which is ptosis. And the last one is dilated and fixed pupils. So that's will be if there's lesion of the left side of the cerebral peduncles and there will be central paralysis on the right extremity. Yes, yeah, so there's um, hemiplegia. Hemiplegia means paralysis in one side of the body, right? But the paralysis is central. So this is also known as Weber alternating syndrome. Yes, keep that in mind. So if you get any question from question 24 to question 
clarity, you should be ready to memorize this because if I want to explain the pathway and explain the lesion step by step, it will be a five hour lecture, right? So lesion of the cerebral peduncles weight involvement of the red nucleus on the left. What are we going to see? There'll be symptoms of oculomotor nerve palsy, which I just explained. Cerebellar ataxia on the right extremity. Yes, so on the right extremity, there's cerebellar ataxia. And I think we all know what cerebellar ataxia is from the previous um, video, yes? This is also known as alternating Benedict syndrome. Please keep this in your mind. Lesion of the pons varroli on the left side. Yes, what do we see? We see paralysis of the mimic muscles on the left. So ipsilateral, because it's on the left, right? So ipsilateral paralysis of the mimic muscles, central paralysis of the right extremity, so contralateral hemiplegia. You understand that? Diplopia and inward crossing of the eye on the left. As you can see, this also lesions of the pontine eye rotation center. Yes, because it is part of cranial nerve six. You can see the patient will look to the paralyzed extremity. This is very important. The patient will look to the paralyzed extremity, but if there's lesion in the posterior part of the second frontal gyrus on the left side, this is known as cortical gaze palsy. So meaning that the patient will look to the affected side. So the patient will look to the side of the lesion. So the patient's eyes will be, um, the patient's eye will be directed towards the affected hemisphere. So this is very important. Your teacher will mostly ask you, um, lesion of the pontine eye rotation center and lesion of the posterior part of the second frontal gyrus on the left. So both of them are on the left. Lesion of the pontine eye rotation center on the left. The patient will look to the opposite side. So the patient will look to the paralyzed extremity, which is um, to the right. Yes. Lesion of the posterior part of the second frontal gyrus on the left. The patient will look to the affected hemisphere. Yes. So ipsilateral. That's very important point. So question. 28 talks about um, the reflex arc of pupil of the reflex arc in like pupil light reflex, basically, right? And sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation of the eye. So briefly, we know that the sympathetic innervation of the eye is mediasis, yes, to dilate the pupil, because if you're running from a lion, your pupils need to be dilated so that you can see clearly, right? So mediasis, yes, um, which is you know, which is provided by the contraction of the pupillary dilator, dilator muscle or the radial muscle, right, which is innervated by the alpha-1 receptors. Contraction of the superior tarsal muscle keeps the eyelid open, yes, and you can see the other function. Parasympathetic, parasympathetic innervation is meiosis, so dilation, sorry, const constriction of your pupils, yes, because when you are resting and digesting, you don't need to be um, seeing a lot, let's put it that way, right? So it's innervated by the pupillary sphincter muscle, of course. So let's talk about the reflex arc. Okay, so this is a very, um, this is a very uh, beautiful picture. As you can see that when light, so when um, light is, when there's light on the eye, it will be carried by the optic nerve, as you can see. So let's follow this um, green, this green pathway. So carried by the optic nerve, as you can see, the green will come via the optic tract and it will come to the pretectile nucleus. And the, the pretectile nucleus would send this innovation to the what? Edinga westphal nucleus. The Edinga westphal nucleus, right? Now, very important that if you look closely, as you can see, that this pretectile nucleus takes um, the innovation to the right side and to the left side, as you can see, to so both sides, right? And then this Edinga westphal edinga westphal nucleus. Why is it important? Because this edinga westphal nucleus is the origination of the oculomotor nerve. So oculomotor nerve starts from here, yes? And then you can see, let's follow the purple pathway. As you can see that it will go, go, go to the ciliary ganglion, to the ciliary ganglion, and via the short posterior ciliary nerve, it will, const it will cause contraction of the pupillary sphincter muscle, and its pupillary sphincter muscle is what? Meiosis, yes, to constrict the pupil. Now, so if you shine light on the on the left eye, let's say this is the left eye, right, and it will be carried by these um, green fibers to this way, this way, follow my mouse, yes, to the ciliary ganglion, and it, is, and it will 
stimulates the pupillary sphincter muscle and will be what meiosis here. This is known as the direct pupillary reflex. Now, because your, pre, your protector nucleus also sends innovation or sends fibers to the other right edingal westphal nucleus. Part of that information will be carried to the right side this way, this way, as you can see. And it also causes what? Contraction of the uh, right side. So this is known as indirect pupillary um, reflex, right reflex, as you can see. So that's basically what they are explaining, what your teacher wants you to say. Or if you say that, your teacher will be happy. So we are done with question 28. So let's talk about question 30. Question 30 talks about um, topical diagnosis of trigeminal nerve nucleus. So your trigeminal nerve nucleus um, supplies what sensation in the face and pain and temperature sensation in the tongue, right? So of course, classic presentation will be facial pain, lots of sensation in the face, um, decreased reflexes in the face and um, your muscles of mastication will be affected too and your tongue, the pain and temperature sensation will be lost. So if there's lesion of the trigeminal nerve nucleus, the sensory nucleus, because the trigeminal nerve has the motor nucleus and the sensory nucleus, right? The motor nucleus is for the muscles of mastication, and the sensory nucleus is pain and temperature sensation in the tongue and the sensation in the face, V1, V2, V3. So if there's lesion in the sensory nucleus or the trigeminal nerve, you're going to have what? Of course, you're going to have decreased sensation on the face, yes? So it will be ipsilateral, a uh, loss of sensation on the face, contralateral hemiplegia. So these um, lesions, I got it from your from the neurology textbook. So it is correct. It is lesion of the trigeminal roots. You're going to see facial pain. What is facial pain? Meaning that when you palpate the point of the trigeminal, when you palpate the trigeminal point, the patient will feel pain, right? So there'll be mononeurotic type of decreased sensation. So if you, if there's lesion of your trigeminal roots, so you know that your trigeminal roots will give you your V1, V2, V3. So you're going to see complete loss of sensation in the V1, V2, V3, and then V1, V2, V3 area. Yes, please, if you don't know what the V1, V2, V3 area, you can just check that up. I cannot give you this lecture like we don't know anything, right? Because you know your V1, V2, V3 area. So Google it. Also, there'll be decreased reflexes in the face and palpation of the trigeminal points, and it can also be a hepatic rash. If there's lesion of the trige, if there's lesion of the trigeminal nerve, just V1. Yes, if there's lesion of the trigeminal nerve V1, there'll be facial pain, of course, and there'll be loss of sensation in the V1 area, right? So the V1 area is like your forehead, your eye region, yes. Why your V2, your V2, your V2 region is like from your nose to the upper part of your lip, and your V3 region is from the lower part of your lip to your jaw. So if there is lesion in the V1, it will there will be loss of sensation in the V1 area. If there's lesion of V2, there will be loss of sensation in the V2 area. And if there's lesion in V3, there will be loss of sensation in the V3 area. Question 31 talks about symptoms of facial nerve lesion. Yes, the facial nerve pathway. So it is lesion of the facial nerve nucleus. There'll be peripheral paralysis of the face. So look closely. This is very important. When you tell your teacher, if you get um, symptoms, if you get question 31, we're talking about symptoms of a lesion in your facial nerve pathway, right? Your teacher wants you to differentiate between peripheral um, paralysis and central paralysis of the facial nerve. So if it is peripheral paralysis or facial nerve palsy, you're going to see what loss of what, because your facial nerve innervates what your mimic muscles, right? So you're going to see loss of eyebrow and forehead movement, inability to close the eye, eyelids, loss of nas loss of the nasolabial fold. So the patient cannot smile, the patient cannot wink at this at just what at one side, as you can see. If it's central, what do you observe? You can see that the lesion only affects this part of the face. As you can see, just the patient will not be able to what smile. But here the patient will be able to what wink the eyebrow and so on and so forth. So this is very important for you to tell your teacher. The teacher will ask you that. So as you can see, 
It has lesion of the facial nerve nucleus. Of course, this will present with peripheral paralysis of the face, which I just explained. There will be decreased um, corneal reflexes. There will be um, spastic hemiplegia, right? Good. It has lesion of the trigonium pontocerebellaris. There will be um, right side um, facial nerve palsy. There will be loss of taste. Okay, so remember if there's lesion of the facial nerve, there's no, it doesn't affect the taste. But here, if you notice that it affects the taste, right? Good. And there'll be decreased hearing on the right. So question 32. So question 32 talks about um, signs and symptoms of lesion of the vestibular pathway. So if there is, let's start from the superior part. If there's lesion of the temporal lobe, there'll be auditory agnosia. So the patient can hear, but the patient cannot identify the sound. The patient, the patient will hear a bell and the patient will not be able to say that this is a bell, right? If there is irritation of the temporal lobe cortex, there will be auditory hallucination. Yes, good. If there is, if there is unilateral lesion of the cochlear nerve nuclei, there will be decreased hearing, there will be especially loss of high tones, the, there will be negative Rene and Schwerbach tests, and Weber's test will be positive, meaning it will lateralize to the healthy side, right? So if, there, if the unilateral lesion is in the left side, you're going to see that the patient will be able to hear more on the right side. Then if there is unilateral lesion of the cochlear nerve, there will be complete lack of perception of sound. So the patient will not be able to hear loud sound, patients will not be able to hear um, low sound. Yes, it will lateralize to the healthy side. So if the lesion is on the left, it will lateralize to the right side. Then there will be deafness, also known as sordidity. Now, question 33 talks about bulbar and pseudobulbar paralysis. So bulbar paralysis is very, bulbar paralysis is lesion of the lower motor neuron of the cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and 12. While pseudobulbar paralysis is lesion of the upper motor neuron 9, 10, 11, 12. Yes? So now, because of course, bulbar is peripheral lesion, it will present with peripheral paralysis. And because um, pseudobulbar is lesion of the upper motor neuron, it will present with central paralysis. So what is the difference, right? In bulbar paralysis, there will be absent phalangeal and palatine reflex. But in pseudobulbar, it will be present. There will be tongue and muscle atrophy and fasciculation while in pseudobulba, it will be absent. There will be absent reflex of oral automatism, but in pseudobulba, it will be present, yes, because this is central paralysis. So there will be pathological reflexes like sucking reflex, right? Now, there will be absence of forced laughing and crying, but in pseudobulba, it will be present. In pseudobulba, the paralysis is bilateral and there is absent of alternating syndrome, or in peripheral, it can be bilateral or unilateral, and alternating syndrome will be present. Respiratory and cardiovascular disturbances occur more in bulbar paralysis, and in pseudobulbar paralysis, it is absent. This is the difference, and your teacher will ask you the similarities. Please, the similarities is what the three Ds, dysatria, dysphagia, and dysphonia, meaning that both bulbar and pseudobulbar will have dysatria, dysphagia, and dysphonia. Okay. Now we'll talk about the alternating syndrome. Alternating syndrome of the midbrain, alternating syndrome of the pons, and the alternating syndrome of the medulla. So alternating syndrome of the midbrain, we have three, Weber, Benedict, and Claude syndrome. So I think we've explained this before. The Weber um, alternating syndrome, what does alternating syndrome mean? It means that you're going to see um, presentation on one side and another presentation on the, on the opposite side, yes, that are not related. So for example, in Weber syndrome, we're going to see oculomotor nerve palsy. Yes, oculomotor nerve palsy on the ipsilateral side and contralateral hemiplegia. So please, where I say ipsilateral, that is where the lesion is. And when I say contralateral, it's opposite to the lesion, right? And, we, and so that's what Weber syndrome is. Benedict syndrome is oculomotor nerve palsy, which is ipsilateral, and cerebellar ataxia, if you remember from the last, from the, um, like, last two minutes, I just said this, right? So, oculomotor nerve, ipsilateral nerve palsy, and cerebellar ataxia, like, intention, tremor, chorea atetosis, good. Alternating syndrome of the pons, we have the, the Raymond 
here, the Raymond syndrome. You're going to see what it's lateral loss of sensation on the face and contralateral central facial nerve palsy, which I explained to you how it presents, and contralateral hemiplegia. While the um, Millard Gulbar syndrome, M I L L A R D G U B L E R syndrome. So this is contralateral hemiplegia, yes, and it's a lateral peripheral facial nerve palsy, which I explained, and lateral rectus palsy with diplopia. You can see the other one. Alternative syndrome of the medulla, right? So your medulla mostly involves your cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, 12. So we should be thinking about that region of innovation. Yes. So we have the um, Jackson syndrome, Jackson alternating syndrome. It's lateral hypoglossal nerve palsy and contralateral hemiplegia. Aweli syndrome, A-W-E-L-I. Aweli syndrome include ipsilateral peripheral palsy of the palatine and laryngeal muscles and contralateral hemiplegia. And you can see the other syndromes. So question 29 talks about lesion of, signs and symptoms of lesion of cranial nerve 3. Cranial nerve 3 is oculomotor nerve, and I think we've covered that in the previous notes. That is why I skipped it, right? 